Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending on where you are in Australia. Today, I'm on Luchawitta, Tasmanian Aboriginal land, and I want to acknowledge with deep respect the traditional owners of the land, the Palawa people. I want to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and to the Aboriginal community that continue to care for country. I stand for a future that profoundly respects and acknowledges Aboriginal perspectives, culture, language and history, and a continued effort to fight for Aboriginal justice and rights, paving the way for a strong future. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Darlene McLennan, and I'm the manager of the Australian Disability Clearinghouse on Education and Training, ADSET for, for short. Um, we're excited to bring you this webinar in partnership with the National Centre for Student Equity in Higher Education. Professor um, Sarah O'Shea, the director from the National Centre, will introduce the topic and speakers soon. But before we do that, I want to start with a little bit of housekeeping. We, um, I think I've said this, we've had a webinar last week and because we're all coming from our different perspective, different homes around the country, um, sometimes the internet does play havoc for us and, with, and sometimes with you. Um, but hopefully um, everything will go to plan. This webinar is going to be live captioned by Bradley Reporting and will be recorded. The recording will be available on ADSET in the next day or two and on the National Centre's website. If you're requiring closed captions, there is a closed caption button in the toolbar that's either located on the top of, the, on the top of your Zoom page or at the bottom. You can increase the lines by, by um, clicking on the caption box and finding an arrow which then allows you to enlarge that caption box. But we have also made captions available via your browser. So if you go into the chat box, you will see a link to the, um, the browser uh, captioning. If you have any technical difficulties throughout this webinar, feel free to email us on admin at adset.edu.au. The presentation will run for around 45 or so minutes. We want to make it as interactive as possible and encourage you to ask questions. If you have questions for our presenters that you would like me to ask at the end of the webinar, please add that to the Q&A box. So that's, there's two options. There's a Q&A box and the chat box. We encourage you to use the Q&A box. That's where we'll be asking the questions from. There is also the chat box and that's where we'd love you to actually chat with each other. So you can actually choose um, the all panellists and attendees in that chat box and that gives us an opportunity to have a chat throughout the um, presentation. So it might be that um, one of our presenters uh, mentioned something and you might know a little bit more and you might want to put a link up or, or so forth. So really encourage you to chat. So just to confirm, if you have a question for the speakers, please use the Q&A pod and if you have a general chat with each other, please use the chat box. Okay, so that's all from me and now over to you, Sarah. Thanks, Darlene. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which I'm located at the moment, which is the Darawal Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Well, hello and welcome to another uh, National Centre webinar focusing on COVID-19 and supporting our students. These webinars are kindly being facilitated by ADSET, and this week we're ex exploring students' well-being during this global pandemic. My name is Sarah O'Shea and I'm the director of the National Centre for Student Equity in Higher Education, which is housed at Curtin University, but funded by the Commonwealth Government with a dedicated mission to improving the higher education access, participation, retention, success and completion rates for marginalised and disadvantaged people. In a matter of weeks, we found ourselves in a new working and learning context that were completely unplanned and even completely unimaginable just a few short weeks ago. And this webinar is exploring one of uh, the key facets of that, which is the emotional impacts on our university student populations, particularly the well-being needs of our students. And it draws on current interview data with students from rural and remote areas. So I'm delighted to introduce two of our National Centre Equity Fellows who will host this webinar, Dr. Nicole Crawford and Associate Professor Cathy Stone. Nicole is a current Neshi Equity Fellow and a lecturer in pre-degree programs at the University of Tasmania. And her research focuses on equity and inclusion in higher ed, including enabling education, mature age students, regional and remote students, and students and staff mental wellbeing. 
She initiated UTAS's Social Inclusion Community of Practice and the National Association of Enabling Educators of Australia Special Interest Group on Mental Health. Kathy Stone is an independent consultant and researcher in the field of post-secondary student equity retention and success. She's a conjoint associate professor in social work at the University of Newcastle and an adjunct fellow with the National Centre at the moment. As an active researcher, Kathy's publications focus particularly on the experience of mature age, first and family and online students. The final report from her 2016 equity fellowship has provided national guidelines for improving outcomes in online learning for post-secondary education sector. This webinar adopts a just-in-time approach to providing empirically validated evidence to reveal how you can best support your learners' well-being in an online environment. We hope that you can apply this knowledge to your specific context. In today's session, Nicole will present, and Kathy will assist her by reading out some of the quotes and also joining for question time at the end. As Darlene mentioned, please use the, quest, the Q and A function and not the chat, chat function for any questions you might have. So, without further ado, I'll hand over to Nicole and Kathy, and we hope that you enjoy and gain something from this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah and Darlene. Hello, everyone. I'd also like to acknowledge the Palawa people of Lutruwita, Tasmania and pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of the lands wherever you are all listening from today. In last week's webinar, Cathy provided the findings and national guidelines from her 2016 Equity Fellowship on Online Learning. And from there, we drilled down to three essentials for students for this current move online. And those three essentials were firstly, recognising the diversity of students' strengths, needs and circumstances. The second point was about having a strong teacher presence. And the third was about interactive and engaging course design. If you missed that one, it was recorded and it's on the NESHI and ADSET websites. So today I'm going to introduce you to my equity fellowship, which Sarah mentioned I'm currently undertaking that. And we'll make some suggestions for supporting student mental wellbeing in the current COVID-19 context. And these suggestions are based on the experiences of mature age uni students in regional and remote Australia. It's really struck me a lot lately as I've been, we've been analysing the data and just seeing how relevant my preliminary findings are from, regional, from the experiences of students in regional and remote Australia. They're relevant for everyone right now, people everywhere in cities, in other countries, for everyone who's making that transition to working and studying at home and online. Some of the challenges many of us might be experiencing now for the first time are probably pretty standard for people in regional and remote Australia. And I think we can learn a lot from them. So here, I'll just introduce you uh, to my project topic. You can see that the, um, the topic here I'm interested in looking at how we, and when I say we, I mean academic and professional staff and universities in general, how we can proactively support the mental wellbeing of students. And my particular target group is mature age students, undergrad students from regional and remote areas in Australia. So just um, a quick note about how I define mature age. In Australia, there's no one definition. So I'm going with 21 and older at the commencement of their undergrad course. You might be wondering how I define regional and remote. So I'm using the remoteness structure that you, you can find at the map on the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the ABS website. But I'm actually using the one here from the, that's in the final report, uh, the NAPFINE review, um, simply because the colours, I like the colours, they, um, you can see the difference between each category a bit more easily. So basically, Australia gets divided into five categories. We've got major cities, which is orange, the inner regional, pale blue, outer regional, the sort of greeny, bluey, teal colour. Remote is pale pink and very remote maroon. So basically, my, the students in my research are from inner regional, outer regional, remote and very remote. So just for short, I say regional and remote. 
My topic is really the intersection of three areas that I'm very interested in, student mental health and wellbeing, students from regional and remote Australia and mature age students, and that really comes from my teaching in the last decade here at UTAS in enabling education in our pre-degree programs. And significant issues underpin the topic as well. Um, you're probably aware of just the increasing concern that universities in Australia and internationally have around student mental health and wellbeing. Regional and remote students are in the national spotlight. There's been several national reports in, in um, recent years about this equity group, but often the attention is paid to school leavers. So I'm really responding to calls for a deeper understanding of the diversity and complexity of the equity group cohorts. And so I'm looking at an aspect of regional and remote being mature age students. Just a little bit more contextual information here about um, uni student mental health. Momentum is really gaining in Australia regarding high level acknowledgement of health and wellbeing in university settings with recent reports I've listed here, Bake et al, Origin, Higher Education Standards Panel and international frameworks and blueprints such as the Okanagan Charter, which highlight the need for holistic institution-wide settings approaches to wellbeing. And the HESP Recommendation 8, the Higher Education Standards Panel Recommendation 8 has prompted action. Universities Australia have commissioned Origin to develop a framework for unis and that's, that's going on right now. So there, there's a real shift from placing the responsibility onto individual students and on university counselling units for everything related to stu student wellbeing. And that shift is, is moving to more of, taking more of a holistic whole of institution view. And that's the approach I'm taking. So I'm interested in all students in the target group, whether they have a mental health condition or not. I'm interested in what we can all do so I'm viewing student mental wellbeing as everyone's business in the uni community, as do Bake et al and, and others. Just a, um, a little uh, definition here, but it's really difficult to pin down terms like mental health and wellbeing um, because they have different roots in medicine and philosophy and they get used differently in different disciplines and different contexts. So for the purposes of the presentation, I'm understanding mental wellbeing as being about being able to manage the normal stresses of uni and life so you can be productive and fulfilled. And how might that, how might you be able to um, do that? Well, Dodgers et al talk about having resources to meet your challenges. And then, then there's um, human needs to be met. So these four dot points come from a combination of models of wellbeing, such as self-determination theory, and the four dot points are around age, having agency, having uh, belonging, connections, possibility for growth and, and having a purpose. I could talk for a long time about these, about defining these terms and I'll go into that in a lot more detail in my report, which you can check out later on in the year. So what have I done? Uh, just a quick look at the data collection. I received data from the Australian Department of Education and that, that's enabled me to get like a national profile of my target group. I developed a student survey that was administered in the second half of last year. And in February this year, we, um, so my colleagues Sheridan, Gemma and Alan and I, we conducted the 51 in-depth uh, interviews. So um, for, for the purposes of today, I'm going to share a few snippets from the survey that relate to students who are online and then come up with some suggestions from the data analysis of one of the open-ended questions in particular and the interviews. So um, yeah, just I'll just mention too that of the 53% the of the survey respondents study fully online. Now here's one statement in the um, survey. I have at least one person, staff or student who I can turn to at university for support. Now 31.1% of the respondents disagreed or strongly disagreed with that. And you might think, oh, well, that's not the majority, but it's still, it's still pretty concerning. And um, the statistician has done a lot of work to help me with, um, with all of this. And she's drilled down deeper and run some tests to see, well, who's actually saying this? So if you look at on campus versus online, it's 
online students and will like to disagree or strongly disagree with this statement. Just uh, another one here. I have the statement is I have a supportive peer group face to face or online at university. 46.7% disagreed or strongly disagreed. And again, drilling down deeper, it was the online students who are more likely to disagree or strongly disagree. We asked the question, did you consider deferring or withdrawing from your course this year? So the year when they did the survey last year. And 47.7% of the respondents said yes. And then when we drilled down looking at um, some demographic characteristics and some other statements to see who was saying yes, it was, it was more likely that online students said yes, students who found the teaching environment stressful, students who um, felt included were more likely to not consider withdrawing and students who agreed they had social connections were less likely to consider withdrawing. We asked why, uh, why they said yes, and um, these are the top five reasons. So stress, feeling overwhelmed by my university study load, mental health difficulties, I couldn't fit study in with my other commitments, and financial difficulties. We asked an open-ended question. Um, what communities do better to support the mental wellbeing of mature age students from regional and remote Australia? And just to give you an indication of the response to that, we got 50 A4 pages of eight point font in response to that one open-ended question. We did a detailed thematic analysis and we found that the responses were mostly about teaching practice, the teaching and learning environment, the content, the course delivery, course assessment. So basically all about teaching and learning. Students' experiences vary across the country, between universities, within universities, and even within courses. The 51 interviews really showed how empowering and transformational the actual learning can be, but at the same time, how stressful and disempowering aspects, some of the practical aspects can be. So what I've done is distill the preliminary findings down to the most relevant for the online, for, for the purpose of this webinar, for the purpose of our current COVID-19 environment. And we have these seven areas. So firstly, knowing students' needs. Secondly, being aware of practical challenges. Thirdly, the importance of facilitating student connections and providing opportunities for questions and answers. Fifth point there, it, the importance of checking in with students. The sixth, promoting your university student services. And the last point is really a reminder, and something you might not be aware of, just the massive impact you have. And often it's the really small actions that really count. So what we're going to do is elaborate on these seven points. As Sarah said, Kathy's going to read the quotations. And then we're going to, then I'm going to spend a bit of time unpacking the quotes. And then at the end, Kathy will do some, some summing up. Oh, first of all, though, I just wanted to present this slide I showed earlier. I just think it's worth having that in our mind, what's needed for mental wellbeing as we, um, as we unpack the quotations. So here we have the first quote from a student who lives in a rural area who works night shifts. She has small children and she's studying fully online. Well, this student says, my study is a tiny desk in their playroom. I've just got a little swivel chair, a tiny little desk and stuff cluttered around everywhere. Often I'm listening to a lecture with the kids climbing on top of me so concentration can be harder. Sometimes I bring my laptop out and I'll listen to lectures while I'm doing the dishes or while I'm cooking dinner. Yep, it's tricky. So this student would really have loved to have had, an, had after hours access to a quiet space away from home, but due to where she's located, she didn't have that. And right now, students in regional and remote Australia who might normally have had some alternatives, if they lived, say, an hour from a regional uni campus, they might have visited that regularly, or they might have visited a local library or a regional university centre where they would then be able to use high speed internet, computers, etc. So right now with us you know, physically distancing, they won't have those options. 
Similarly, students in metro areas who might normally rely on free and fast internet and computers on their uni campuses probably won't have that access right now. So I just, I really like this quotation because I think right now it's this student's reality is suddenly the reality for a lot of people studying and working at home. It's a really good insight into students' lives. They may be juggling parenting and work with their uni studies. And in the current context, they could also be trying to homeschool their kids. And also, like all of us, managing with this extra layer of stress and anxiety in these uncertain times. So the point here is this first one is knowing students' needs and understanding their diverse circumstances. So the tip here is to take an inclusive approach to everything you do, to your course content, delivery, the tools you use on your learning management system, and to really think about who, who is it including? Who might I be excluding? So for example, if you offer synchronous sessions, not all students will be available at that scheduled time, or maybe their technology will mean that it just doesn't work for them. So a solution is to ensure that you, you provide material asynchronously as well. It's really important to look through an equity lens and think about the diverse needs of students within your course and to en endeavour to accommodate all students. I I've been thinking about a, a student in my class a couple of years ago with autism who attended lectures and shoots face to face. I'm wondering what the transition for him is like right now, you know, I wonder what it's like for him if he's in Zoom breakout rooms, if that's really anxiety provoking, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, I don't know. But I wonder, will he have choices? So if that is anxiety provoking, will he have options to say respond to questions in a discussion forum that might be a bit less intimidating or less stressful? I've also been thinking a bit about the use of videos. We've got our videos on right now, but I wonder, that could be quite stressful for some students, having their peers and teaching staff peering into their personal spaces. So it's just little things like that, that yeah, maybe we don't need to have our videos on that if, if students don't want to. I guess the point is something that Shelley Kanesh calls teaching for diversity. And um, I've actually got a reference um, to a nice short piece she's written that's a nice little introduction to universal design for learning and it's in the references at the end. But um, yeah, I just want to mention really that UDL principles are really important. So having multiple ways of presenting the same material, multiple ways of engaging students and multiple ways that students can demonstrate their learning. So on to the second quote here. The internet does drop out and we do lose connectivity. Afternoons are worse and it's also impossible to watch a lecture when there's no download. So while it's a frequent experience for students in regional and remote Australia to have inconsistent and unreliable internet access, this could increasingly be the case for students and staff in the city as well, with more bandwidth being used, with more people you know, working from home, loads more video conferencing going on. And I also want to mention we can't assume that all students can afford high speed internet and, and also their, their usual workarounds like using a uni campus or a local library for free Wi-Fi, they, they might not be an option, probably not an option now. So the, this takes us to our second point, which is be aware of practical challenges such as bandwidth. So the tip is to keep your technology simple and do, do ensure that the lecture recordings and other materials can be downloaded. Because that's really going to give students the opportunity to download, say, their weekly course content or their assignment readings or whatever, when they can. So it might be that their internet doesn't work in the afternoons. Maybe at 11 o'clock at night is when they can, their, their internet is better. So it's just giving them the flexibility to be able to download it when they can or when they're near free Wi-Fi. And then they have the flexibility to listen or read or watch at a time that suits them. Here we have a couple more comments. The ability to actually talk with other students face to face about an assignment and how they're approaching it and how they've interpreted a question and all that, that's priceless. And then another quote, and that's, and just encouragement too. I think having someone there on Facebook that you can just message and go, you know, I've had a rough time with this, or, you know, this assignment's been really difficult. Yeah, you've 
sort of got someone else you can relate to. Yeah, so students are really screaming out, I think, for staff to help them connect with each other. It's, it came up a lot in the open-ended questions, in the, the survey question. It takes, I think it takes a fair bit of time as it is for on-campus students to find like-minded peers, and it's even more difficult for online students. I also know it's tricky to facilitate as, as staff, but I really do encourage you to endeavour to create opportunities for those kind of corridor type conversations that take place in the face to face. If it's worth thinking, how might I um, enable, facilitate that to happen in the online context? And why? Why do I think this? Well, students learn such a lot from each other. They learn a lot about the academic culture. They learn a lot about the day-to-day -day requirements of their course. Sometimes, you know, a student might remind them of a deadline or they might help them with some referencing. And they also provide each other with a lot of emotional support. So the, this leads us to our third point, which is facilitate student connections. So how might you do that? You could do that, um, say, synchronously in a video conference or via the discussion boards, so asynchronously. You could take a few minutes just at the beginning or end of synchronous sessions for some for some lighter informal communication. You could ask questions on the discussion boards and encourage students to share something, an interest or a hobby about them. You could take the lead so students get to, that they enjoy seeing their, their teacher's human side. And I also just wanted to mention, because it came up a fair bit in the um, open-ended question as well, is the use of Facebook. So, Students often use it them, like within their group, so it's got nothing to do with their teaching staff, but they might um, initiate a closed Facebook group for their particular unit for the semester and they find that um, a way of supporting each other, just, just realising they're in, they're in it together. They're not the only person feeling the way they're feeling, etc. Here we have another quote. One of the biggest things that holds you up on assignments is that you've got a question and you post the question to the forum and you have a look and it hasn't been answered or you don't really understand it still and sometimes it can take a while to get a response. Yeah, so students studying online really want opportunities to ask questions and to get timely answers. They really miss out on hearing questions and answers that occur in the face-to-face -face environment when sometimes you're just, um, you know, setting up your PowerPoint or writing on the whiteboard before you start your lecture or you might be walking down the corridor and a student asks a quick question about the assessment task and in 30 seconds you can provide them an answer. They haven't needed to wait, they've got it then and there and off they go and they can go about their assessment task. So I really get the sense that online students um, really seek more of this. And if they don't understand their assessment task, it, that's really stressful. And then it's even more so if, if the advice isn't readily received. So it isn't easily, if they don't get it easily. So the ne that leads us to this point four about providing opportunities for questions and answers. You could dedicate a regular uh, video conference meeting for questions and answers about upcoming assessment tasks. You could um, pop your student consultation times into an online meeting. Uh, whatever the case though, whatever you do, do, let's say you use discussion boards, it's really important to maintain that through the semester. And something I actually mentioned last week in um, last week's webinar is it can feel a bit demoralising when you're posting information on the discussion board because you don't get you know, heaps and heaps of responses, but you don't need to. That doesn't mean students aren't reading your comments and benefiting from them. And uh, just another point is to make sure your expectations with students and staff are very clear around response times for emails and discussion posts so that you know students aren't waiting all day on a Wednesday to get an answer if, if you're not going to post until a Thursday. Here we have a suggestion from a student. Have someone that can check in with the student from time to time, a simple call to see how they're progressing or if they need any help. Speaking from experience, I won't ask for help, I'll tackle everything on my own. 
which normally means I end up stressed. Some people are too embarrassed to ask for help. So studying online, fully online, can be quite isolating. Some students are really proactive in asking for questions, but others aren't. So having lecturers or tutors check in with students, it really contributes to students feeling that they're visible, connected, they're valued, and that they belong in their course or in their uni. So the suggestion here is our fifth point, and that is to check in with students. Be approachable and proactive in supporting students. I suggest checking in semi-regularly in a personal way via email. And I've got two suggestions here for how you might do that. And it really, it'll depend a bit on your staff to student ratio for sure. So it was really interesting how often in the open-ended question, this idea of check, this um, yeah, theme of checking in came up. And also that students mentioned using the phone, like saying how beneficial it would be if someone would actually talk, you know, call them. So, um, I know that might sound really daunting if you've got lots of students, but I just thought I'd um, share an experience I've had years ago, or a few years ago, teaching a writing unit, students were face-to-face -face and on, some were online, and I really felt the online students were missing out on just particularly those little corridor conversations where someone can quickly get an answer about their assignment. So I decided as we were approaching um, an assessment task due date that I would uh, make myself available for, to call students. So I sent an email to the distance, the online student saying, okay, Thursday, I'm free between two and four. If you'd like to check in about your assignment, I can call you. I didn't get a single answer to that email. So then I thought, right, the next week, I'm just gonna do it. So I sent an email saying, okay, I'm gonna call you. So um, if you'd like to ask me any questions about your assignment, it'll happen at this time. And I had the students' names and phone numbers and I went through and called them. And every single student did have questions. They sort of started off saying, oh yeah, I'm okay. And then as soon as I'd ask, oh, and tell me about what, what are you arguing in your essay? And what, what reasons you've got behind that? Blah, blah, blah. So every single student actually did have lots of questions. They um, were really grateful that some, but actually they were shocked that someone had phoned them to start with. And then they were very grateful for that time just to talk through their ideas. If students didn't answer, I left a message and very soon I was getting these return calls. So I felt that it was really beneficial for the students and for me too. I had a real sense of, of what they, um, where they needed more assistance. Now, alternatively, another idea is a short two-minute video. If you've got hundreds of students and you know that lots of students are asking similar questions, you could just cover that in a couple of minutes and that's another way to check in. We have a couple of uh, quotes about support services. Reminders that support services are available and there's no harm in using them. I think the more separated you are, the less likely you are to know of what you can do or things you can access. So look, I'm guessing most people listening all work in educational institutions of some sort. We know that, say, at unis, we all have student support services and there's loads of information about the different services on our institution's websites, but students are often unaware of them and even more so when they're studying online. And they might have heard about them at orientation, um, but if that's a while ago and if it wasn't of you know, major relevance to them then and there, plus there's so much information, they might have forgotten about it. So the point here is to promote your university student services, uh, such as counselling, disability services, academic learning support, and all sorts of other student, student life programs that your uni offers. Most of those services will be um, going online right now too. And it's kind of, I think it's sort of not enough just to say it once at the beginning. It might be something that you can send, you can send reminders a few times in the semester and in different ways. So it might be that one time you mention, mention something in an email or on a discussion board on your learning management system or even um, at the beginning or the end of a class. I know right now lots of uh, universities, student services are really quickly providing information on their websites about coping with COVID-19. 
I had a look the other day at my uni's website and found info there. I looked at University of Newcastle, they've got great stuff there and other unis have as well. So if your uni's probably doing that and if they haven't yet, you could always look elsewhere because um, it seems to be publicly available. On to our seventh quote. A lecturer sent me an email as he noticed I dropped the subject and was checking in to see why. I explained that I dropped due to personal stresses. He replied emphatically and wished me well. He didn't have to check in. It was meaningful to me at the time. So it's this point I think is really important because it's really it's something that struck us. Um, my colleagues and I who did the interviews and each time we had a meeting to discuss the data analysis, it really struck us the positive impact of really small actions, such as replying to a student's email or a discussion post. It's far greater than you realise. Numerous interviewees recounted these small actions that really made them feel that their teacher knew who they were and that they cared. So for many, for many of you studying, uh, for many students studying online, their, their teacher is their connection to their course and their university. I don't think students are expecting us to bend over backwards. Like they really acknowledge that teachers are overworked, but it's, um, they're really grateful for these small actions. They really mean a lot and they don't forget them. So yeah, this is really just a reminder to you that your impact is enormous and it's often just the small, the little kind human things that, that make a, a really big difference. So the seven points we've gone through, they, they come, really come from distilling the themes from the students, um, the open-ended question in the survey and the interviews, which are of relevance to our current move online. I just wanted to add a few extra thoughts with my lecture or teacher hat on because I couldn't help myself and that is Really just to say that many students you know, might have got themselves into a routine at the beginning of semester with their face-to-face, with, -face, with their face-to-face -face classes, fitting in their work shifts, their daycare, managing everything else in life. So this move online will be a massive upheaval for them as it is probably also for you. So in my humble opinion, I don't think you can expect to be charging on as per normal and you might want to reassess your expectations yeah, of you and your students. I think pastoral care and support roles will be even more important right now and you might think how on earth can I take that on too? Well I think some of the, the points we've covered like checking in, having opportunities for questions and answers will enable that to happen. That'll be able to happen in those times. You might want to think about how, how you are feeling are you finding it hard to focus? If you are, it could be your students are too. So just having little chats about checking in about things like that, they'll probably find comfort in hearing that their peers and their teachers are feeling the same. And I also think it might be a time where going back to basics would be helpful. So going back to basics with things like time management and just taking, you know, taking one little step at a time. That, that sort of, those reminders might be really helpful for students at this time. And I can't talk about student mental wellbeing without mentioning staff. When you have students who are stressed out or anxious, it can really impact on you too. There can be quite an emotional load to carry. And this is the case in the best of times. So that in the current circumstances, I would think this is going to be compounded. So you might just want to think about some things that you can do to support each other. And I've just got a few points there that um, colleagues in enabling education and I have found helpful over the years in a special interest group. We've been meeting for about five years. We just check in uh, for an hour on Skype every couple of months, pretty much share what we do, um, share some challenges, some solutions, ideas, and it's become a really nice um, supportive community of practice in which we get to debrief and really, I guess, share a bit of that emotional load. So here are a few areas you might, you could explore, explore further. Um, I've got the references at the end. So what I'll do now is hand over to Cathy to sum up and then there'll be some time for questions. Okay, great. Thank you, Nicole. And um, I think it's just important to stress that this um, 
this information, this data, the findings from the data that Nicole's been going through, um, this has come from, as she said at the start, just a huge number of student surveys. I mean, she's had really massive numbers in this um, project. So this really is evidence-based and in a way it probably bears out what a lot of, of you know already, but it's kind of nice to know that what you might be doing or thinking is backed up by this research. But I guess to sum up is, um, you know, do what you can, but first and foremost, you have to look after yourselves and each other because these are very challenging times, as Nicole has said, and it's really important that people don't expect too much of each other. And, and I, I liked Nicole's point about sharing that with the students, saying, well, this is really stressful for me, guys, so goodness knows what it's like for you. And I think re students respond to that so well, um, that human approach. And keeping it simple, try not to be too clever technologically, given that a lot of people might be struggling with this. Um, be clear, as consistent as you can, and flexibility, I think, is really important at this time because not only are students having to make this change to online if they're not familiar with it, they've also got their kids at home from school and all those sorts of things. And it's really important not to forget to draw on the expertise and support of other colleagues in the university. Ed tech people are just fantastically helpful at times like this with online the counselling staff, the disability advisors, the academic learning advisors and so on. They're there to help and support not just the students but the academic staff as well in all sorts of ways and to, um, I guess, take a collaborative approach to supporting students. And certainly in this moment we can learn a lot from the experience of students who, are, who come under those equity categories such as students in regional and remote Australia because um, these sorts of situations, the difficulties can often be exacerbated from um, by, for students who, who are already at, uh, at some level of disadvantage. So hearing from these students is really important at this time because we get more of a handle on what it's like for students who are, um, have a, a degree of disadvantage. And in this case, in Nicole's uh, uh, research, it's a geographic disadvantage relying on Nicole for the next slide. Okay, so if we think about the webinar today and last week, if any of you were here at last week's as well or had the opportunity to listen to it, I think between us, Nicole and I have, have really sort of tried to get across these three key messages. And the first one, which we've both talked about, probably ad infinitum, <laughs> is about really trying to get to know your students, um, understanding that they are diverse, they have challenges, but they also have strengths. And so it's important to sort of try and find out who's in the class, what's the mix of age circumstances, uh, the, the um, uh, sort of various circumstances they're living under, what might be the key issues for them, uh, do they have family, are they working, are they got internet problems. Now, you're not going to find out all those things, but by giving them the opportunity to introduce themselves and you introduce yourself, and the opportunity for Q&As and any sort of conversations that you can have, you'll get to know more about them, which leads on to the second uh, key message, which is about facilitating those connections and keeping up that communication as much as you, you, as much as you can. And both Nicole and I uh, today and last week have talked about many different ways of doing that. And I've just been kind of watching some of the chats as they come up. And you've there are a lot of great ideas out there as well. People are giving each other, I can see, lots of really good ideas too about how to connect with students. But it's really important to have that teacher to student connection, encouraging students to connect with you, and they will only do that if you're connecting with them. And, uh, and ways of connecting them with each other uh, within the classroom situation, encouraging the, 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 the Facebook sites, all those sorts of things, giving feedback, um, responding, setting clear expectations and guidelines about when you'll respond and what you expect of them. And checking in. The checking in is great if you can manage to do that. The number of students have said to me if they've had a phone call, they're just bowled over by it. And it doesn't have to just be by the teacher. You can team up with someone in student support about, look, I'd really like to try and check in with these students that um, to see how they're all going, can we work together on this? So it can be a coordinated approach so that it doesn't all fall on you. And the third one is that sort of leading into that is about your university support services. 
promote them to students, but make use of them yourselves. Because one of the, I mean, I've, I worked in university support services for many, many years, and we can all, we can all get caught up in our little, our own little bubble, our own little work areas. And it's just so important for support staff, professional staff in support services to be working with academics and vice versa, because we have a huge amount to learn from each other. And by working together, we can uh, not only support each other better, but provide much better support to the students. So really, you know, make, make the professional services your, your friends, because uh, together a lot more can be achieved and promoting them to the students at, at every opportunity is a really important way to go as well. So they're the sort of three key messages really, weren't they, Nicole? If we if we run out of our slides now. <laughs> yes. So now we're over to questions, is that right? <laughs> yep. That's that's brilliant. Thanks Kathy for that. I did drop out, which was a panic. I seem to every webinar lately I drop out for about five or ten minutes just to make sure that my heart and blood pressure are all okay. Um, so we've had um, a couple of great questions. Um, so if people do have some questions, you can put them into the Q&A um, question pod. And also we've had some fantastic chat between each other. So well done. I love people that can do two things at once. I also forgot to mention that the National Centre and ADSET have also been tweeting throughout um, this webinar, so you can actually check out our tweets and please like and reshare, which would be fantastic. So one of the questions we got, um, which was how can professional staff, um, like the staff that may be in the, the care, care roles within universities and, and TAFE, how are they able to support academics and teachers to achieve um, that care-based approach when um, they are already overstretched? Have you got any recommendations to, you know, to help academics and teachers, um, how we, can, we as support staff within the sector can help? Okay, so this is, I'm looking at the question now. Um, it's, uh, so are you t I'm wondering if the person's referring to academics being overstretched or professional staff being overstretched. I suspect you're all overstretched. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be um, a good call so, there, Cathy. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And um, look, speaking from the perspective of having been a professional, member of professional staff for many, many years in the past, um, in my experience when I was working with academics on particular projects, I always felt that I was achieving much more than I would have on my own. So while everybody might be feeling overstretched, um, what's the saying? A problem shared is a problem halved. And it's maybe not quite halved, but it is amazing how much more you can do if you're working together. And I think it's just beginning to strike up those conversations and saying, okay, is there a way we can work together on these issues? And, and together, I think it's possible to work out some, some really nice pieces of work that, uh, that, that makes the, um, I suppose it just gives that support to each staff member, but covers a lot more students and a lot more uh, issues. I don't know if you've got anything to add to that, Nicole. Yeah, um, over the years uh, in, when we've had, so, so basically I'd teach, normally I would be teaching, teaching, being a lecturer or tutor, and when we'd have our staff meetings to talk about our students' progress, we'd invite counselling staff to attend those meetings. And obviously they're not going to be able to do that across all the universities, but maybe once a semester they might be able to go to a, a few. And we found that incredibly useful. It was a, this two-way um, learning went on. So we would learn more about... Um, how students might behave or whatever, depending on a particular situation they were in. And the counsellors would learn more about it from our perspective as expectations of what it is to be in an online classroom or a face-to-face -face classroom. So I've found that to be, to be very useful, yep. Okay. Another question was, and you may not be able to answer, and a couple of people have had some suggestions in the Q&A, but around a, on any online training, is there any MOOCs that are out there at the moment that can support staff in understanding, you know, teaching and support in the online environment that you know of, Cathy or Nicole? I do know of one. I just can't, I the can't can... tell you the link off the top of my head, but I can That's... send it to you. Yep, there's, excellent. Um, there's a, a great MOOC for, um, it's actually not, it's actually not just online teaching. It's it's a it's a MOOC on um, uh, 
generally um, teaching, but there's a component of it that deals with online. So I'll, I'll send that link through. Um, Darlene, and then you could send it out. That's fine. So what we um, usually do also is if we get too many questions to be answered as a part of this webinar, we um, send the questions and our brilliant panellists have agreed to answer those questions where they can and we put them um, on our website along with the recording. So um, you know, we get to get to those answers. Um, you raised a, a quick... So Sorry? Deacon, were you thinking a Deacon Uni have a MOOC? I haven't done it, but I... That's another one. I'm thinking of the Latrobe one, but, but okay, maybe, so yeah. yeah. Yeah, anyway, well, hopefully we'll have a few up there and a couple yeah. of other people within the chat pod have also suggested some other online training right. and resources, which is brilliant. Oh, someone's so, just put one up, I think. Yeah, for see. UNSW, yeah. Yeah. so that's yeah. great. great. Yeah. Okay, well, that's, that's great. That's brilliant stuff about this sector. It's yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I know. <laughs> fantastic. It's um, nice. You talked about trying to engage learners um, through um, Facebook and open q and Is there any other, people just ask, is there any other ways that you've kind of looked at trying to get student engagement? Is there any other suggestions you may have? Oh, uh, well, all the sorts of ways, I suppose, that, that Nicole has covered and, and that we talked about last week as well. I mean, there's a multitude of ways in terms of engaging students. Um, there's also, I'll send a link through as well, Darlene, about um, a, uh, a guide to asynchronous um, discussion groups, which is really good by the FOLD group, F-O-L-D. If people just look that up, actually, F-O-L-D, asynchronous discussion. And there's a terrific guide uh, which was put together on how to generate student-to-student uh, -student interaction really well through an asynchronous discussion format. So that's one I can think of off the top of my head if people want to look at that up, but I'll send through the link on that as well. Brilliant. Now, there was um, a question in regards to an international student needing um, to see a psychiatrist, but it looks like there is actually, um, and it's probably maybe out of the scope of your knowledge, but there actually has been some great answers in the, the Q&A pod um, now, so which is fantastic. So I think that's probably answered that person's question. <laughs> That's great to have this. Um, now, because I dropped out, I've actually lost some of the questions. So if I haven't asked your question, please put it back in the Q&A because I did lose some Darlene, of the questions when I, I had to I, reboot. Darlene, yep. I, saw, I saw one which I, I'd quite like to answer on um, yep, good. How, do, how do we convince our managers that online learning and proper student admin, such as follow-up calls and so on, requires time and that our workload should not be measured just based on scheduled class and time for marking. Yeah, and uh, question. <laughs> I would, yeah, I think if, if you were at the webinar last week or if you can access the guidelines that uh, came out of my research to improve outcomes in online learning, it's on the NESHI website, I would, um, look, print those out and take them and wave them under the nose of your managers because this is evidence-based research which shows that it really does have to be done properly and enough time and resource does have to be um, put into it. And if you can show that there is clear evidence around this now, that it, 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 the time does need to be dedicated to it, that uh, it takes more time to teach online more than a face-to-face than -face class is what most people who teach online will tell us. Mm -hmm. So I think that some joint actions required by you and your colleagues to say this is the evidence and this is what we need to have a discussion about. And that's that's the, the the best I can suggest, unless Nicole's got other ideas. No, that's I agree with you, Kathy. Mm. All right. Um, thank you for that. Um, just a question here. It's um, probably yeah, it's not necessarily the audience of academics within uh, universities, but it was asking if you could give advice to high school te teachers moving online what would it be? Because sometimes we do have some high school students that, you know, and that's certainly something that they probably haven't, ex um, high school um, teachers, and sometimes, you know, they have probably haven't had as much experience of that online environment as others mm -hmm. have. So ideas for high school teachers? Yeah, Get moving it on, moving their yeah. teaching online. Yeah, look, I, I imagine that the um, interaction needs are, are just as strong, if not stronger, giving the and, and keeping that connection with the students going I'm, I'm really just talking off the top of my head here because I haven't done research on this um, <laughs> my daughter's a high school teacher teaching online at the moment she says that um, allowing the kids time just to talk to each other on a zoom call sometimes she just kind of sits and listens and gives them time just to chat about 
all sorts of stuff that may or may not be related to the course. I thought that sounded like a good idea because yeah. they really must miss that class interaction. But I'm sure there are, uh, a, I'm sure that I hope on this chat line, there may be other people who've got better informed answers than I have. But I guess from my experience with university students, um, that interaction with teacher and other students, I would think is, is similarly important. Mm. Yeah, and just I think the last. Could, um, oh, sorry, sorry I, I think you could apply. I mean, I haven't done research in high school children either, but I think you could apply. Mm. What you're saying, I've just noticed, and this is just from talking to my friends with kids who have, got, you know, just in the last few days have gone online over the last couple of weeks, and it just seems that it um, they're online from like nine until one or nine until three without much of a break, and I just think that everything being synchronous, that might work with some students, but others mm. really need a bit of a break or, or need some time mm. to work away on their tasks without being in the video. In the video, mm. That could be absolutely exhausting. That, but that's yeah. based on anything except for my personal opinion. <laughs> All right. Now, looking at the time, we haven't got a lot of time there. What, just one, maybe one last question, which is a great question around a lot of students are actually saying they're overwhelmed at this stage, especially mm -hmm. in online classing. How can we best respond here? And I wonder if there's any information overload or tipping point that people are getting to. Any advice? Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'm, I'm looking at a similar question too, which is about, you know, should we tell students that completing a course in their circumstances will be close to impossible? I think that it's hard at this stage if we're past the census date. I don't know if that's the case for all universities though, but certainly I know a lot of universities ex extended the census date, so there may still be an opportunity to have conversations with some students about whether or not they want to pull out this at the moment. But I think that rather than telling them what to do, you know, we need to be, people need to be able to listen to what to what they they actually want to do and to let them know that it's normal as as Nicole was saying to feel overwhelmed that they will feel overwhelmed that you're all feeling overwhelmed we're all feeling overwhelmed so this is normal and maybe yeah. there's a way of reducing it to the basics you know I think that um, they, they just need to be able to do enough to, to to get through and not to expect that they're going to get the distinctions and the high distinctions and, and to give them a bit of leeway and a bit more flexibility around things, it would be what I would suggest. Nicole, have you got any yep. thoughts? I might, yeah. I might actually, sorry, I might just wrap it up, sorry, because we okay, are running sorry. out of time. Okay. Um, so, but we will sorry, we'll go through the questions and um, and if we can add any um, further information to those questions, we will put them onto the, to the website. Just a quick plug is next week we do on the 16th of April ADSET has another webinar which is around um, students on the autism spectrum um, which is uh, the um, transition to higher education for autistic students on the 16th you'll be able to see that on our website uh, the National Centre is about to de develop a page on their website around COVID-19 ADSET has also got a page where we've got relevant information that, um, that hopefully can support the disability staff within the sector. Uh, so please go and check that out. So sorry I had to cut the two speakers off because um, we're getting to the end, but now I'd like to hand back over to, to Sarah to finish up the session. Thanks, Darlene. And um, thank you to Cathy and Nicole for a really interesting presentation. Um, just some really great snippets and key points there of what you can do to assist in your students during this difficult time. Uh, if you'd like to hear more about their work or indeed the work and research of all our equity fellows, please do subscribe to the National Centre newsletter or just take the time to browse our website which contains a wide variety of open access materials that are available to everyone across the sector. Um, as Darlene mentioned, we will have the webinar recording up on the website within a matter of days as well. Thank you, Nicole and Cathy, and thank you, Adset, again, for sponsoring us and allowing us to use your webinar platform. Bye. 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 Bye-bye. everyone. Bye.